Welcome to the New York State Museum, our streaming series on Facebook Live. Today I've brought you to New York City Metropolis, a part of the museum that's in history collections, but I'm an archaeologist. My name is Dr. Daria Merwin, and as I mentioned, I am an archaeologist here at the State Museum. My day-to-day -day job here at the museum is one of the co-directors of something called the Cultural Resource Survey Program. And what me, my team, what we do together is go out in advance of construction projects all over New York State to ensure that if there are archeological sites or historic resources like important architecture, we make sure that we document that before construction happens. That's my day-to-day -day job. When I take off that hat and put on my researcher hat, I am an underwater and maritime archeologist. And welcome to my underwater world. We've got an Atlantic right whale here for um, our background today. It's really an awesome specimen, so I wanted to bring this to you since you can't be here with us in person today. So today I'm going to talk a bit about underwater archeology span and maritime archeology, span and a little bit about the relationship that people through our long history have had with really watery environments coasts, rivers, oceans, seas, you name it. We're going to talk about it. So the first fun fact I have for you today is globally, all across the world, about 40% of the world's population lives in a coastal zone. And for our definition, a coastal zone is about 100 kilometers. And for you non-metric folks out there, that's about 60 miles from a major coast. So 40% of the world's population. When we come to New York State, we're talking about 80% of the state's population lives in what's considered a coastal zone. So 16 million of the roughly 20 million people in New York State live within or near a coastal environment. That's a pretty amazing number, 16 million of us. So before we start to talk about the archeology span of coast and coastal areas, let's think about some reasons why it might be good to live on a coast. Well, the first reason is when you're at that interface of land and water, you've got access to a really wide variety of resources, plants and animals, and even mineral resources, things like rocks to make stone tools or clay to make pottery vessels. These are all usually pretty near at hand in a coastal environment. Shorebirds, fish, shellfish, even animals like this giant whale. Can you imagine that if you were living in a coastal place and a whale this size washed up on the beach, how, what an amazing package of food and fuel that would be for the people in your group? So coasts provide lots of resources and sometimes they provide those resources at what archeologists would call a low risk or a low cost. So for example, some of you have probably been to the beach, maybe to the ocean. Have you ever waded out into the water and felt clamshells underneath your toes? If you have, you know that even small children can contribute to the family's dinner by collecting those shells. That's a pretty low risk activity to wade out into water and find clams and bring them home for dinner. So lots of good things to eat, lots of materials to make things with. That's one reason why coasts are so good to live in. Another reason is that they're really good for facilitating travel, especially if you have boats. Coasts provide an open area, basically a corridor for people to travel back and forth. So whether you're traveling directly, packing everybody into a boat and moving, or if you're trading over the water. In fact, the roots of modern globalization date back to transatlantic sail, transoceanic boat building and seafaring. We wouldn't be in a global environment if we didn't have that technology. So lots of good resources and easy ways to move people and things about the landscape. Two really good reasons to live on coast. So we have some good reasons to live on coast. We know that modern humans, mostly in places like New York State, live in coastal areas and around the world. There are millions and millions and millions of people living on the coast. Well, what about the past? Well, that's where archeology span comes in. So before I go too far, 
How many Frozen 2 fans do we have out there? Anybody? Have you seen the movie Frozen 2? Do you remember what Olaf said about water? How water has memory? Well, in Olaf's worldview, he thought water actually did have a very specific memory, that it could record places and times and, and events. To an archaeologist, though, what water does is it preserves memory. So preserving memory under the water, what does that mean? It means that all around the world, there are archaeological sites hidden from view because they're underwater now. Well, why is that? Some of those sites have sunken. But some of those sites, in fact, most of those underwater sites are drowned by rising sea levels. And the water, the constant waterlogged state, oftentimes can preserve those sites really well. But let's get back to that sea level. I'm going to show you an image of what Eastern North America looked like about 20 to 25,000 years ago at the end of the last ice age, at the end of the Pleistocene. So right over here, we can see an image of what global seas in Eastern North America would have looked like when it was the end of the Pleistocene and there was a massive glacier covering most of New York State. A little part of Long Island was exposed and a little part of the far western tier, uh, southern tier, was exposed as well as dry land, but most everything else was ice. And all that ice used so much of the world's ocean water that sea levels were much lower. And what does that mean in terms of measurements? Well, what that means is the coastline, if you're standing in New York City today, looking out to the water to New York Harbor and the Atlantic Ocean, that coastline would be 90 to 100 miles farther out. That would be dry land. And in terms of the depth of the water, we're talking about 300 to 425 feet. Now, if you've been paying attention and following along with the museum broadcast, you might remember that Dr. Bob Ferranic talked about fishermen finding giant specimens, animals, mastodon, mammoth, when they go out fishing off the coast of New York. And the reason for that was because that was dry land. Well, when people first came to this area, we know at least 12,000 years ago, a big part of that landscape that's now covered by Atlantic Ocean, that was also dry land. So not only do we find megafauna like mastodon and mammoth and those giant bones, but we know that there are likely lots of archeological sites under that water as well. So that memory is preserved. And we actually have a question about that. How much of the world's ocean has been explored and documented? And is there a percentage? Ooh, I, it's a very small amount. I can tell you, if you added up all those coastlines that were exposed at the end of the last ice age, about 20,000 years ago, we'd be talking about a continent roughly the size of Africa. So that is an amazing swath of landscape and only a minuscule amount has been studied by scientists looking for these sites. So thank you for that question. That was a great question. Um, I've been one of those scientists lucky enough to do that and I did it in New York Harbor as part of a team from Stony Brook University. Now a few years ago, we went looking for submerged pre-contact Native American sites and we knew they were there because a site had accidentally been discovered when a beach dredging project was happening. And basically that was a boat went out into the ocean, sucked up sand from the ocean floor, and dumped it on the beach in New Jersey to make a new beach. And this happens pretty routinely. But in this case, there was a very attentive beachcomber who started noticing things in the sand. And all told, she amassed a collection of more than hundred artifacts all made of stone, what we call lithic artifacts. So I took a team of intrepid scuba divers and we went diving in the general area to look for more. And I can show you an example of what that looks like. This is a flake. It may not look like much, but it's actually a stone tool that was made more than 6,000 years ago when that part of the Atlantic Ocean was dry land, 
And it may have been used for cutting or some other purpose. It might also just represent the waste from making a stone tool. And that's actually what archaeologists in Eastern North America find most often when we're looking at these ancient sites. We find the stone that's been preserved. So we knew we were on the right track. It's a little tricky looking in the Atlantic Ocean. It's a little bit of a needle haystack issue. So what we did to refine our skills is we traveled up the Hudson River and we went to northwestern Westchester County to a place called Croton Bay where in a shallow embayment of only six feet of water, we went diving and we tested the, the bottom of that embayment and we came back with a lot of stone artifacts suggesting that there's a drowned site there as well. The Atlantic Ocean finds are in about 60 feet of water. So it's a bit of a challenging environment to work. The Croton Bay, only six feet of water. We were able to stay there longer, get a lot more evidence. And over here, I've brought some of the examples of the tools found in Croton Bay. So this is something called, people often call it an arrowhead, but we call it a projectile point because it probably wasn't used as an arrow per se, but definitely something sharp and pointy that you might use in hunting. And this particular example is about 4,000, 3,000 to 4,000 years old based on its style. And then we have some tools where the edges have been chipped to form a cutting edge. And then those waste flakes from stone tool manufacture that certainly when they're first made, they're very sharp. You can use them as standalone tools but we've, we find these a lot. That is, is definitely a hallmark of a pre-contact site. Um, and we get very excited when we find things like the point because that could give us a rough idea of how old things are. Another example of the kind of artifacts is this bigger rock right here. It might not look like much, but it has the very telltale signs of being broken in a fire. Uh, it's a, a rather uncreative term, but we call it fire cracked rock. We find these in hearths, in fireplaces, anywhere where people built a fire. Um, these rocks fracture in not predictable ways, but telltale ways that we know that that's a trace of a past campfire. We actually have a question uh, asking how you identify these sites. Besides the dredging, what indications are there underwater hinting there is an archaeological site? Oh, great question. In New York, in places like New York, the number one landscape factor that will predict if you have the location of a site is a major water source. So in the case of looking underwater, and I'll bring you over to a nautical chart to sort of illustrate this. Well, it's kind of hard to see. This is the Hudson River coming down. This is the Verrazano Bridge, so Staten Island and Brooklyn. And this channel closely follows the drowned channel of the Hudson River. And we can use technology, mostly sonar technology, using sound waves to map the sea floor to tell us where those river channels are and where the streams emptying into the major river channels are. And unfortunately, I don't have an image of it, but the finds we made off Sandy Hook, and this is Sandy Hook, New Jersey, we were in an area right around this part of the ocean and when we looked at the sonar record for that area, we are in an area where streams are all running into that major Hudson River basin. Now the Hudson River has been home to humans for at least 12,000 years. And of course today it's home to millions of humans as well. It's a great place to live. Um, again, we've got all those resources at hand. It's a corridor for transportation, for communication. And the same is true in the past. So in places like New York, the number one feature we will look for to find an underwater site is a drainage channel, something major like the Hudson, and especially those tertiary and secondary streams going into the river. Um, that's the most high predictive landscape feature. In other places of Eastern North America, uh, I've worked in Florida, in the northern Gulf Coast of Florida. Those river channels are always very well defined by something called karst or limestone formations. So you can follow the limestone formations from the land, follow them underwater. They are good for 
predicting where water was on an ancient landscape. They're also good for where the lithic or stone resources for making stone tools would have been located. So those are two factors why people would live in that environment. And in Florida, it's a little easier because it's shallow, warm, and clear. So New York is a bit challenging, but that's what we do. We explore and we, we rise up to the challenge, and sometimes we're lucky enough to find that needle in the haystack. So I guess I'll wrap up talking a little bit about the more um, mind, the cognitive, the psychological aspects of living in a coastal environment. And this is something that feeds into the study of something called maritime cultural landscapes. Now, cultural is basically any human group and how they organize themselves, their clothing, their food, their language, their customs, all that goes into culture. So thinking about a maritime cultural landscape, you sort of have to shift your perspective. So imagine instead of standing on the land and looking out to sea, imagine being on the sea and looking back to land, how your perspective changes and how your culture might reflect that. So this is an idea that's been around about 40 years or so in terms of how do we define what a maritime cultural landscape would look like from a cognitive or mental aspect, but also to an archeologist, how we go about and understanding who is living in one of these landscapes and how would we recognize it just by looking at the artifacts that are left behind. So, Part of the mental aspect of it is, think about, if you're a kid, think about the mental map of maybe your yard or a nearby park or just the place that you go to a lot. And if you're a grown up, think about maybe an outdoor space where you grew up. Think about the trees that you knew. Think about how you knew the seasons changed. Think about the plants and animals that would tip things off to you to know where you were in space and time. So for now, think about what it's like to go outside and I hope it's a nicer day tomorrow so you do get outside. Think about looking at those robins in New York that have come back that let us know it's spring. Look at all those flowers around. Well, from a maritime cultural perspective, the hallmarks would be things, where are the shellfish beds? And that brings us to some of our shells we've got over here, clams and oysters. They're kind of the unsung heroes of a coastal environment. Um, they are great food resources. Their beds are predictable. You can get them year round. Um, we have places around Southern New York State where by studying the clams, um, you might notice there are all these rings each ring actually represents a day of growth. So if you find a clam in the archeological record, you can tell when that clam died or was harvested. And by doing this, we have learned that people were living in one spot year round, much longer than we realized. These are also kind of the unsung hero because the calcium in shells, when they make it onto land in an archeological site, they neutralize our acidic soils and preserve things a lot better than had they not been there. So knowing where the shell beds are, knowing when fish come at particular times of the year, knowing when shorebirds migrate, that's part of the cognitive landscape knowing where different groups of people live. So if you're on Long Island and you have relatives across Long Island Sound, knowing how to get there, knowing all those landmarks so when you get in your boat, you do know how to get there. So those are sort of the, the hard to get at aspects of culture in terms of finding hard material traces. But we also have things like place names. There are so many native American um, pre-contact indigenous place names that we still have on our landscape. And even for me, where I grew up and went to school on Long Island, my school district was called Bayport Blue Point. Both those names come from their location on the Great South Bay. So we have all these cues that sort of clue us into how important that maritime landscape is to where, we're, where we are. We can also look to things like evidence of trade is that trade likely coming over water? And again, I'm going to go back to Long Island because that's where I've done so much of my work and where I grew up. So high downstate, um, things like uh, material code soapstone or steatite 
We know native peoples were mining it from places like Rhode Island and Connecticut, but it makes its way to Long Island, and the most direct way to get there is by water across the sea. So even though we don't have the boats that people were using 2,000 years ago, we have that indirect evidence that people are moving these materials and probably doing it over the water. We also have fishing technology, things like harpoons and hooks, and even net sinkers, which are chipped stone that would hold down nets. If we're lucky enough, we can find nets. We could even find impression of nets pushed into wet pottery as decoration. And we can use that to reconstruct what that aspect of technology would have looked like. Um, of course, there are the boats themselves. And I mentioned other things like place names, um, navigation, knowing where the stars are, knowing the winds. These are all aspects that feed into that maritime cultural landscape. So do we have any other questions at this point? We did have a question kind of, and you did talk about it, but if you could expand on it, what can the flakes tell us about people's daily lives, some of the artifacts that you found? Ooh, that is a good question. They are very humble, aren't they? They're just chips of stone. But in some places, the Croton Bay example is actually kind of fun because you might notice we have different materials. We've got this white material, which is quartz. So if you're from downstate or you've been to beaches on Long Island, those beach cobbles, that's quartz when you chip away at it. And then we also have these darker materials. That's chert or flint. So we have a range of materials, but in places like Croton Bay in northern Westchester, all those materials are near at hand. But we also find materials that are not local. So we will find, I don't have an example here, but we will find something called jasper, which tends to be mustardy yellow and can turn red, especially when you heat it. That jasper comes from places like Staten Island and Pennsylvania. So when we find it on a Hudson River site, a hundred or more miles away, that's evidence that trade is moving back and forth. And it can be just the humble little flake that tells us that. So when we start to look at the whole group and assemblage of flakes and figure out what are local materials, what materials look like they're long distance, that can tell us something about trade or interaction or direct movement of people. And the more information we get from each site, the more we can learn about how people were organized in this landscape. People have also been successful at looking at residues on flakes. So um, there are direct residues that tell you if they've been used on animals or plants. There are also um, things called useware traces. So a soft material like wood will leave a different mark under the microscope than something hard like using it on stone. So useware can often tell us how that flake may have been used. So there are lots of different things that even that very humble flake can tell us. We do have a question about what other type of tools could you find besides Ooh. for the projectile points? Sure. We find things that we think are, um, we call them expedient, which means quick, something that's quickly made. Uh, the, the technical term for them is a uniface, something that's been chipped on one side, or a biface, something that's been chipped on two sides. So we find a lot of these things that look very expedient that may have been used to chop or cut. Um, this one over here is sort of unusual. It's broken, but it's almost knife-like in its form. So things that look like chisels, things that look like knives. Um, certainly when we get into bigger tools, you can see things that look like an ax or an adz that we think are being used for wood cutting, perhaps even to make something like a dugout canoe. So the, um, I don't have a great <laughs> selection of stone tools for you here today, but a lot of them look very informal, that they're not um, as carefully shaped, let's say, as some of those projectile points that have very specific styles. And that's a whole other question of what those styles might mean in terms of their function, but also maybe their social meaning in terms of signaling what group you belong with based on what is the style of point you're using. So lots of interesting questions. Most of the tools we find, maybe it's a chopper, maybe it's a knife, maybe it's a scraper, could be used for a wide range of different activities. 
Excellent, and we do have one question that honestly I'm not sure if you'll know the answer for or answer to, but if we don't, we'll make sure to get the answer posted as soon as possible. And that was how heavy was the whale that's on display? Oh, that's a really Our good Atlantic <laughs> right whale. Uh, oh, we've got an answer. It's 25 tons. Excellent. Luckily, we have the information right here. Um, but yes, definitely, I, it's, it's not hard to imagine. And we, we know that native peoples in coastal New York and southern New England would take advantage of beached whales and butcher them and use their, um, use their body for a variety of things, use their bones, use their meat, use their blubber. Um, this would be an amazing package to, to wash up, especially in the winter time when other food resources might have been scarce. So certainly, uh, Native American people in the historic period continued a tradition of whaling as well. Excellent. Thank you. And I don't know if anybody has any more questions. It looks like we might be done, but thank you so much. Well, thank you for joining us today. We miss you. We can't wait to see you again. But everybody, stay well out there. Get out and explore when you can, but be sure to tune back into the State Museum. Bye.